Beckett family, members of Saving Grace Lutheran Church, enjoy our service today. Good morning. And, and welcome to Saving Grace Lutheran Church. And we are happy to be gathered here together to worship our God. And we're also happy that it's sunny out. At least I know that I am. And so again, welcome. I'm Pastor Dan, and Pastor David will be preaching a message entitled, You've Got More Than My Attention. So we have that to look forward to. And we also have special music this morning. So a lot of good things for us. And let us rise. As we begin our service, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty and everlasting God, you revealed your Son in glory to the disciples as the Messiah that the, that the disciples would listen to him. When Christ comes again, we will see him in his glory. And Lord Jesus, you are true God from true God, that God's glory would be revealed through you. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Holy Spirit, you have given us faith that we may proclaim who Jesus Christ is. Guide us as humble servants that we may stand firm in the faith. And let us take a moment to consider these things. Our Heavenly Father has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, that we may know the one true God. All that Jesus did glorified God. Forgive us, for we have fallen short and sinned against you. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. As a called minister of the Church of Christ and by His authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let us pray together. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet your glory is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, who has redeemed us in the waters of baptism and through faith in him. He has given us the hope of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 24, verses 8 through 18. Moses took the blood and dashed it on the people and said, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. Also they beheld God and they ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Second uh, uh, Peter, chapter one, verses sixteen through twenty-one. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 17th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before him, them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to him, them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. From the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, and they were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Now, if you think about change in your lives, um, you can uh, have an old house, right? 
you can paint it, you can put new fascia on it, you can put new shingles on it, but is it still an old house? It's still an old house. It doesn't change what it is. You can buy new clothes, but you can't change the person in the clothes, right? You can buy a new car, and in what, 10 to 15 years, you, just, you have a car just like the one you got rid of. <laughs> we like to think that we can change our environments, change the things around us when, when it comes to a transformation. That's something that only God can do. Um, some people like to go camping. Who likes to go camping? We're in Wisconsin, so every hand should go up. And there's another type of camping I found out about last night. You can actually, um, you get this huge motor home or a big, huge third wheel, I think they call it, or something like that, a trailer, and you go out into the, the wilderness and, and you plug into the grid and, and you have power and air conditioning and air, all the conveniences of life, as well as some people even have dishes. Can you believe that? And I was told last night, that's not camping, that's glamming. <laughs> it's glamorous camping. Huh? Everything continues at a state of rest. This is um, Isaac Newton, the first law of motion. So I'm getting you ready for Monday, kids. All right? Everything continues at a state of rest unless it is compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. That is... This will continue to be at rest. I could, I could do this. This will continue to be at rest unless some other force is placed upon it. And then it moves. Now, this is true when it comes to inanimate objects. It's not true when it comes to kids, right? They're never at rest. They're always in perpetual motion. And you have no idea what they're going to do from one second to the next. When Jesus went up the mountain with his disciples, with Peter, James, and John, he went with three people. They happened to all be men because if you were going to have a witness in a court, you had to have a man a witness 2,000 years ago. And you actually needed three witnesses to say that it was true. So Peter, James, and John uh, go up the mountain with Jesus. Now, we don't know if it's it's actually the fest, uh, Festival of Tabernacles. We're not certain exactly what's taking place, but at the Festival of Ta Tabernacles, they used to make a tent on the mountain, down by the, the bottom of the mountain. And then they would wait for the presence of the Lord. We heard about it in the first reading for today. When Moses uh, received the Ten Commandments and he went up the mountain and a cloud overshadowed the mountain and the glory of the Lord shone upon, shone upon him, then uh, they knew that God was present, and so they still did that, still do it today. There's still the Feast of the Tabernacles in the Jewish faith. So they went up the mountain, and Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now everybody speculates exactly what Moses and Elijah must have told Jesus. If you hear preachers speculating about what Moses and Elijah was telling Jesus, they're off on the wrong foot. Okay? We'll never know. Until we stand in his presence and we can ask him. What we do know is this, that Jesus was setting his face toward Jerusalem, that he would die. And um, at that moment, Jesus was revealed the way that he would be when he was revealed in glory, when he comes again. And I can only imagine that Moses and Elijah were there telling him before the foundations of the world were laid that this was to take place. Encouraging him as he walked forward. You see, he was the Word made flesh. Who dwelt among us. Now, what's interesting about that scripture in, in uh, uh, verse 14 of, of uh, John chapter 1, um, in the Greek, who lived among us, is the word tabernacled. He pitched his tent. He tabernacled among us. And at that moment, Jesus was revealed for who he was. The very presence of God. Suddenly, uh, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I wish, if you wish, I'll make three dwelling places, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. 
And then a bright cloud overshadowed them, and the, and the voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when they heard this, they fell to the ground. They were overcome with fear because they knew what that meant, that God's very presence was there. The same presence that took place in Exodus 24, the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud, and now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days. They knew something amazing was happening, and they didn't know exactly what it was, but they knew that God was working in their lives. And and that God was revealing who Christ truly was and is. Did you know that um, there was a guy named, oh, I don't know, Carl Bentz? Carl Bentz. He uh, drove his first automobile through the streets of Munich, Germany. It, he had a daughter named Mercedes Benz. After, uh, he named the car after his daughter, Mercedes. The machine uh, angered the citizens because it was too loud and it scared the horses and it scared the people. And, and there were speed limits. Uh, a, a speed limit within town for horseless carriages were 3.5 miles an hour. And outside the city limits, you can go 7 miles an hour. And uh, Carl Benz said to himself, I'll never be able to sell these cars unless I can go a little bit faster. I can open it up. Well, he learned how to open it up, didn't he? And so he said I want mayor, uh, he wanted the mayor to come for a ride with him. So what he did was he orchestrated for a milk truck to be parked with two horses about a block away. And he took the mayor for a ride. And as he came up to that horse-drawn uh, uh, milk truck, it pulled out. And he had to go slowly. And the mayor was furious. He said, go faster, go around them. And he said, I can't because there's a law that you can't go any faster than 3.5 miles an hour. And he said, well, who made that stupid law? <laughs> and he decided to change it. You know, um, nothing, uh, the truth is, nothing will ever uh, change until we are convinced that it needs to be done. And, uh, and has been convinced so, for so long that we need to realize um, hope in something else, even in our own lives. Every single time I sit by a bedside, you know what I usually ask a person? If they don't have too much time, I said, do you, do, I usually ask them, do you believe in Jesus? Sometimes I'll say, I know what the answer is, but I just want to hear it from you. And I did this a little bit over a week ago. And she said, yes, I believe in Jesus. And then um, she thought for a little bit and she said, but I just can't explain it. I just believe in Jesus, she said. Well, that's any Lutheran pastor's dream, huh? That God would take a hold of you? And give you faith, and you would say, when, when you confess your faith that I believe in Jesus, that you don't know exactly why, but it's grabbed a hold of you in such a way that you, it won't let you go. That was the tenacity of her faith. What a beautiful thing. To understand that he takes a hold of us. Actually, the third article of the Creed says this, I believe I cannot by my own effort or understanding believe in Jesus Christ or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel. He has enlightened me with his gifts. He has sanctified me and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he preserves the union with Jesus Christ uh, for the whole Christian church daily and abundantly. Every single day, he guides our lives so that we might understand he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies us. Isn't that amazing? It's not what we do. It's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. It grabs a hold of us. Sometimes it has to shake us. Huh? Remind us who we are, that we're his children, that he'll never let us go. That he guides our lives, that we might trust in him each and every day, and that um, he might have the final say in our lives. Even when... Some guy wants to go a little bit over the speed limit, huh? 
You know, um, the second reading talks about uh, this, that since Peter saw what took place, he says, this prophetic message is morally, uh, more fully confirmed. That is, first of all, you understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. No prophecy comes from human will, but from the Holy Spirit. Now, I was in college, and I still remember one of, my, uh, one of the swimmers on the swim team was brilliant. He was a psych major. And he started to read the Bible alone, and he uh, opened it up, and, and he was starting to see things that weren't there. And then uh, he had some type of break. And I, I heard uh, after he graduated, he wandered the States. And he thought that he was a prophet. But he didn't realize that when prophecy takes place, it comes from the Holy Spirit. He thought it came from him. That's what's so amazing about Peter. Second Peter says, No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, but it comes through the Holy Spirit. And if you think that Lutherans always emphasize the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's because we know that we can't do it on our own. Hmm? That we trust in Him for absolutely everything. How many people know how wide the uh, railroads are? Oh, see? A couple of them. Because I already told this before. <laughs> told this to the boys on Saturday morning. Did you know that railroads are four feet, eight and one half inches wide? Between rail and rail. And why are they eight, eight, uh, four feet, eight and one half inches wide? Well, it's because um, when we started building the railroads, uh, British expatriates came over, and that's the gauge that they used. That's all the machinery that they had. They knew how to do it. They put it together the same way they did over, overseas. But why did they do that overseas? Well, it's because that's the width between the ruts that the wagons would make in, in the dirt and in the mud. Four feet, eight and one half inches wide. And why did they do that? Why did they start making wagons like that? Well, Roman chariots were four feet, eight and one half inches wide. And the chariot need to needed to accommodate the rear ends of two war horses. Some things don't change. And sometimes we're mad we are people or creatures of habit. But here's the beauty. He changes us. He transfigures, transforms us into the likeness of his son, not because of what we've done, but what he is doing in our life. Long ago, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, God spoke through our ancestors, uh, to our ancestors in many ways, in various ways, by the prophets, but in the last days he's spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. He appointed heir of all things, through whom he created all the worlds. He's a reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. He sustains all things by his powerful word. This one created all things that exist. How many universes are out there? We're still trying to figure that out. And they're saying that the, uni that, that, um, our gal the galaxies are still expanding. So will we ever know? And yet God created all this. And he cares about you so much he knows every thought every hair on your head. He guides your life so that you might know that you're never alone. Matter of fact, you might even be asked someday, um, do you believe in Jesus? And you may respond, yes, I do. But I can't explain why. Because he's grabbed a hold of me. And he won't let go. When Jesus was transfigured, he got their attention. When he changes our lives, he's got more than our attention. He's got all of us. So be it, Lord. Amen.
And now let us sing and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Now let us sing together this benediction. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Go in peace and serve the Lord. Be to God. Amen.